Hi there, and welcome to the second uh, actual video in the Mixed Models series. So in this video, I'm going to talk about the two-stage random effects formulation. So a couple of goals of this video. First, uh, I want to make sure you understand why, in general, we need mixed models for our data. And then I want to cover this two-stage random effects formulation, which is a really useful way for wrapping our heads around what the model is doing. It's not perfect, but it's really great when you're first learning mixed models. So uh, last time I asked you to remember this basic setup for just a regular linear model. So again, we were looking at that sleep study data. So we had reaction times over 10 days, where each day the reaction times expected to become longer because the subjects are only getting three hours of sleep at night. And then we have our design matrix, which has a column of ones, which corresponds to beta naught, which is the intercept. And then the days variable, which in this case just goes from zero to nine. And then beta one is the slope over time. And then we have our error vector, epsilon. So I can write this more concisely as y equals z beta plus epsilon, where z is that design matrix. And epsilon follows a normal distribution with variance sigma squared. And this is, since this is epsilon as a vector, the covariance matrix here, and this is actually a matrix here, um, so this is just an, a matrix with sigma squareds along the di uh, diagonal and zeros elsewhere. So hopefully that notation is a little familiar. For those of you who've done fMRI analyses before, this is kind of old hat because we use this formulation all the time. Okay, so just to give you a setup for the data I'm going to work with here, I'm going to use the sleep study data, but with multiple subjects. So what I just showed was for a single subject. And again, what these data are, are average reaction times, which is sort of funny, um, because they took the within-day data and they boiled it down to a single reaction time. And that's actually technically something we should have done within the mixed model. But the data set doesn't have the multiple reaction time measures per each day. We just have these daily summaries. But we do still have uh, repeated measures because we have these daily summaries over 10 days. There are 18 subjects total. Um, <laughs> actually, I'm not going to make up a 19th subject later on, and it's way later on. If I do, it's like 10 videos from now. But the actual data set has 18 subjects. So here's what the data look like. So I believe this is the subject I showed before. The tops of these little plots in the grid are just subject identifiers. And then you can see that generally each subject has a positive slope. Um, you see there's varying amounts of variability within subject and so on and so forth. So that's what the data look like. Oh, and a nice thing about this data set is everybody has the same amount of data, no missing data. So why do we need mixed models? As I alluded to in the last video, uh, to model the variance properly. So we're going to have two sources of variability. Before, when I talked about linear regression in the last video, I emphasized that there's only one variance in that model formulation, and that's the within subject variance. But when we have data with multiple subjects and multiple measures per subjects, we want to account for the fact that the overall data distribution is comprised of within subject variance and between subject variance. And this is specific to this. It depends on your data structure. Um, it won't always be within subject and between subject. It could be within school and between school. It, it depends what uh, your repeats are within. So anyway, there are other reasons why we need mixed models, and I'll cover these as we go, but I just wanted to focus on the variance today. So I showed this before. Um, these are just density plots for each subject, um, all put together in the same plot. Uh, and you can see that the variance within subject is a little bit different. And then we also want to account for the between subject variance, the fact that there's a lot of wiggle in the reaction times uh, between the subjects. So and you can think of this in terms of uh, these data, since it's reaction time over days, uh, you could think of, if you think about that fitted line, you have a slope and an intercept. You could think of uh, variability within and between subjects in the intercept and variability within and between subjects in the slopes. So it's another way to think about it. 
Okay, so the two-stage random effects formulation is a really handy way to wrap your head around mixed models. It doesn't uh, parallel perfectly what the mixed model does, but I'm going to use it because it's a great useful, uh, it's a useful learning tool. So I'm getting, I'm following the notation of chapter eight in this book, Applied Longitudinal Analysis by Fitzmaurice, Laird, and Ware. And I don't know about your library, but our library has the digital copy available for checkout, which is very handy. So it's a more, um, it may not, may not be super approachable unless you have a bit more of a statistics background. Okay, so the two-stage model. For those of you, again, who are familiar with imaging analysis, this is, we actually analyze our data in these two stages. Uh, the mixed model, to be clear, puts the two stages I'm about to show together. So first step, we're going to look at each stage separately. So in the first stage, focusing on the sleep study data, what we're going to do is we're going to take that model I showed you earlier. Remember, it was y equals z beta plus epsilon, where y was our reaction times, z was the design matrix with the column of ones and then the days, and then beta was a vector with the, um, the beta parameters in it. So what you'll notice that's different here is the subscript i. So um, you'll want to pay attention to where that subscript is because that indicates something that is subject specific. So this is the ith subject. So i in this case goes from 1 to, I think there were 18 subjects. Um, so this would be a vector of reaction times from the first subject. And this is the design matrix for the first subject. So even though for these data the design matrix is identical, you can have differences in the design matrices between subjects. And then beta i is the ith subject's slope and intercept vector, and then there's an error term for the ith subject. So the distribution of the error term, importantly, there, so this, this is just an identity matrix that's ni by ni, where ni is the number of observations for the ith subject, but you'll see there is not an i on the sigma squared. This isn't always the case, but I'm focusing on LMER and R, and specifically in that software, sigma squared is assumed to be the same for all subjects. So again, focus on where there are and are not I's, because that tells you where there's uh, flexibility between the subjects. So this is assuming all the subjects have the same variance. Okay, again, subject vector of reaction times, a two column matrix, intercept in time and days, subject specific slope and intercept, and the specific subject specific error. And again, it's important that sigma squared, it's no subscript of i, so it's assuming the within subject variance is the same across all subjects. Okay, so here it is specifically, uh, we can break it up into reaction time, subscript i, beta not i, beta 1 i, days i, and then it would look like this for the first subject. But you see I've just added those i subscripts indicating we're going to estimate or think about the um, betas for each subject separately. Okay, so the idea, like uh, the conceptual idea We'll see in a minute, this is not actually what the mixed model does in estimation, but conceptually, it's estimating those lines for each subject, which I'm showing here in blue. But of course, it's assuming the variability is the same. The variance, if you're wondering you know, how to think about it in terms of these plots, is how much these um, points, the actual data, are bouncing around each fitted line. So clearly, this subject has really low variability, this subject has really high variability, but under the model assumption, that variance will be the same. And you might be thinking, well, that's a bad idea because um, I would like my model to you know, build in my high variance subjects because then they should be penalized. Well, there's a trade-off um, with that. You have to have enough data to estimate a variance. So sometimes pooling the variance estimate over, the all subject, over all the subjects is more beneficial. So that's effectively what's happening here. So if you are using a different software package for mixed models and it is allowing a different variance for each subject, step back and say, well, how much data do I have for each subject? Unless you have, uh, I don't know, 50 to 100 data points, you might be shooting yourself in the foot. You're, you're having more variance estimates, but they're poorer quality than having a single variance estimate that's pulled. Okay, 
moving on to the second stage model. So starting off, so it's another kind of regression setup. So this beta i is the same beta i we saw before. It's the slope and intercept for subject i. So now what we're going to do is we're combining all of the subject specific estimates in a single group model. Um, there is a design matrix here. It is almost always in these videos an identity. So you can almost, you can just pretend for now that this isn't here. Eventually, perhaps towards the end, um, I'll show what this looks like if AI is not an identity. So, um, but for now, let's just assume this is an identity and I'll make life easier. So th this is then a group parameter vector. So no I here. So this is saying, in this case, if this was an identity matrix, it would give you the average group slope and average group intercept. And then bi does have a subscript i, so this is the error subject, error for subject i. In other words, their wiggle about the group mean. How much does each subject's intercept wiggle around the group mean for the intercept? How much does each subject's slope wiggle about the group mean? So in order to show that, there's actually a covariance matrix that describes that. So this is a two by two matrix, the upper left hand element is going to be that between subject intercept variance, then the bottom right hand will be the between uh, subject variance for the slope, and then there can also be a covariance. You know, might be thinking, well, why would the variance for a slope be related to the variance of an intercept? And it actually does make sense if you think about it. Uh, in terms of like ceiling and floor effects, sometimes if, if a subject, say, their reaction time started out really high, so if they're just slow to begin with, their slope might be less steep So um, compared to somebody with a very fast reaction time, because maybe they're just slow. So when they're tired, they're going to be just as slow. So you can have these dependencies between the slope and the intercept, which, will, um, which you can allow for in this matrix G. Now, a really important thing is that at the end of the day, um, the parameter estimates we're gonna look at are these betas right here. We don't actually look at the beta i's, and bi, even though there's a subscript i, um, that's not estimated. So uh, I'm gonna repeat this uh, later on, because in our mixed model, this is the only subject specific thing that we end up with at the end of the day. And we can't estimate the subject specific slope and the subject specific intercept. It's not automatically estimated by the model, just the variabilities of those things. So BI is just a subject specific distribution. So estimating a random variable kind of doesn't make sense. Uh, you never say, oh, uh, well, here's a normal distribution. Can I estimate it? You focus on estimating the parameters of the normal distribution. So um, we'll circle back to that idea. I just want to mention it now because this is related to those blups or I'm going to call them conditional modes um, in the future videos. So technically, those two steps are not estimated separately, but we put them all together. So this is the first stage model. I'm just writing it out here. Here's the second stage model. And you can see we have beta i's in both. So I'm going to plug the second stage model into the first stage model, and then after some simplification, you get what's at the bottom here. So again, at the end, the only things that have eyes, the only thing that's subject specific are the reaction time vector, design matrix, uh, AI again, let's just assume that's an identity, because in most cases it will be until um, we get to more uh, complicated models. Uh, ZI is again the design matrix, BI, is not a subject specific estimate, it's a subject specific distribution. It's the random effect. And then epsilon i is also a distribution, the error, the, the within subject uh, error. So epsilon i, again, is the within subject error. bi is the between subject uh, error. And um, if ai is an identity, this just simplifies to this equation here. Okay, for sleep study, for the first subject, uh, it would look like this then. So here's the yi, the zi, ai is just an identity matrix because we're just averaging the slopes and intercepts over subjects. Here's the group slope and intercept, 
here's the random effects and the error term. And of course it simplifies to this because of that identity matrix. Okay, so this is actually what the um, LMER is going to estimate. So even though in the two-stage setup we do have within subject estimates of the slope and intercept, they technically are not estimated um, when you're running a mixed model, but this model here is estimated. Okay, so uh, again, the beta, this is the fixed effect. It's typically the thing that we're interested in, in this case, uh, the group effect. Again, since there isn't a subscript on the beta, then that means it's a group effect, not a subject-specific effect. And remember, bi is a random variable. It's not giving us subject-specific estimates of the slope and the intercept. It's very um, tempting to think that based on the setup. So it's, it's just defining the variance. And g is a two-by-two two variance covariance matrix, where again, the um, upper uh, element is going to be the variance between subject variance of the intercept. The lower right-hand corner is going to be the between subject variance of the slope, and then the covariance refers to the covariances between the slope and the intercept. And then epsilon i is just the within subject variance, and this is again assumed to be the same across all subjects. So if you were to run LMER, here's part of the output. I just selected the pertinent parts, and this is for the sleep study data. So you can actually just run this uh, in R, and you'll get the same output because the data is built in. And here are the pieces. So there's the sigma squared. So this residual line is showing you the within subject variance and reaction time. Then these three things make up the G matrix. So we have the between subject variance in the intercept, the between subject variance in the slope for days, and then the covariance between the two. It's very small. Um, this data set doesn't have a um, strong relationship between the slope and the intercept, and we'll talk about simplifying the structure later. But, and then um, down here, this is the part, oftentimes people ignore this top part, which is actually rather important, but the bottom part is the, the actual um, estimates for the group intercept and the group slope. And then you get inputs, given your p-values and whatnot. And we'll go through this output more later on, but I mostly wanted you to be familiar with where these variance terms were located. So the takeaway from this um, is to make sure you understand this two-stage model. It gives you a way to, it'll, it'll help in the long run for when you have to set up more complicated random effect structure. For now, I'm just sticking with this very simple design. Um, where we basically just have um, a random subject effect, no nested or crossed random effects, which we'll talk about down the road. So make sure you feel comfortable with the fact that there are two sources of variability, and that's the whole reason we're using the mixed model, more or less. And uh, also make sure that even though in the two-stage formulation, it, there are, you know, in stage one, you have within subject estimates of things, Technically, once you plug stage two into stage one, there are no within subject estimates of the slope and the intercept. It's misleading to see this bi because sometimes you think, oh, well, that's where I get the within subject slope and intercept, but that's describing the, the variability. It's a random variable bi. It's not something you estimate. You're estimating the parameters of that random variable, specifically the covariance. And we'll come back to that in the next few videos. Um, what that BI is and how we can use it. So if you have questions, go ahead and ask on the Facebook group. I'm also on Twitter if you want to throw some questions there, um, or you can put them in the comments below, but the Facebook group is probably the quickest way. So thanks for watching and have a really good day.